since he ran that incredible 159.41. I mean, yes, it wasn't an official world record, but it was it was a great moment for sport, wasn't it? When we woke up the following morning, even though the Rugby Union World Cup was on, the following <laughs> morning, it was his image on the front page of all the newspapers. It was it was the space moment for distance running, and he did it beautifully. Yeah, I mean, can any man go under two hours for the marathon has been a question that's, you know, been, been circulating in the distance world for a long time. And Kipchoge finally doing it, even if it wasn't in circumstances which can be called an official record, was very special. And he, he often says himself he, he wants to inspire people, make people believe they can do something that they thought was impossible. So... I'm sure he, he certainly inspired a lot of people with that sub two hour. He does look very relaxed, equal with four London titles with the mighty Ingrid Christensen. So if he wins a fifth, that will be a record. If he wins, he will also be the oldest ever men's winner here in London at 35 years old and 11 months. Yeah, he, he, you alluded to his consistency at the very top. The only marathon he's ever lost was when he ran, I think it was 204 on the nose, or 20405, came second to Kipsang's world record. So yeah. it took a world record to beat him in what was, I think, only the second marathon of his career. He has, I'm touching wood as I say this, he has, as of yet, he has never run a bad marathon. His consistency is absolutely phenomenal. The world record holder, the Olympic champion, the first man in history under two hours, albeit on, the, on a non-record ratifiable course and conditions. He is an absolute master of his craft. And it, it's also easy to forget a global champion over 5,000 metres as a teenager 17 years ago. That is how yeah. long he's been around at the very top. Well, Chris Thompson's been around a while as well. 2.11 on his debut. European Championship silver medalist, a fabulous five and 10,000 metre runner in his day. So many injury problems. What was that, a skimming a stone? <laughs> I, I really like Tomo, he's such a nice man. Johnny Meller, one of only three Brits with the Olympic qualifying standard. Callum Hawkins, twice fourth in the World Championships, uh, not competing here, so Mo Farah, one of the pacemakers. Now to one of the Ethiopians who could potentially put Kipchoge under pressure, Muli Wasihun. Eighth on the all-time list with that 203 last year. Mozinek Geremu, World Championship silver medalist, fourth fastest in history, 205.55. It took a very, very special run to beat him 16 months ago in this race. The greatest of all time. He's been performing at the highest level for two decades. World champion. Sorry, world record holder. World champion over the 5,000 back in 2003. And he is the Olympic champion. And a multiple Paralympic champion, Dame Tani Gray Thompson, is the official starter for the race. She's doing excellent commentary duties for the BBC with the elite men's and women's wheelchair races, which will be the third instalment of drama. It's a triumvirate of excellence here in London this morning. So Bridget Koskai delivered in the elite women's race. Will it be the same here? in blustery, wet conditions in London. Elliot Kipchoge going for a fifth victory here. He hasn't lost a marathon since finishing second in Berlin. It is just quite the most extraordinary record. He's done everything in this sport. And without Kenanisa Bekele in the mix, on paper, the stage is set for another demonstration of excellence from the greatest we've ever seen. Yeah, we were talking about consistency by Kipchoge, Rob, just before the start. And for me, that's almost as impressive as, as the fast times he runs because so much can go wrong in a marathon. It's such a long race. You only get a few attempts a year. You know, the weather conditions can, can really affect things. Of course, the courses are all different. It's not really like running on the track. And we really saw that brought into focus at the Doha World Championships last year where... The, the performances in the stadium in, a, in air conditioning were really, really phenomenal. Uh, but out on the roads, it was very tough, very hot, humid conditions. So for me, Kipchoge's consistency uh, more than anything really is, is, shows what, what an amazing athlete is. And as you said, he's been going for a long time, back in 2003, uh, winning 
a medal on the track in the Paris World Championships. So, but I think he's really the marathon. Perhaps is is his event. Oh, without any shadow of a doubt. I mean, it was great in Rio to see him complete his Olympic medal collection because he had a bronze and a silver over the five in, in Athens and Beijing. But yeah, he's, he's found his home at the marathon. Mozadek Geremiu proved himself a championship performer with that silver in Doha after finishing second to Elliot in London last April. Wasihun mm -hmm. ran really well. Cisse Lemmer is another brilliant runner from Ethiopia. Third in Berlin last year. He's also gone sub 204. A whole host of young Ethiopians who will fancy they can get in the mix against Eliud Kipchoge, but they face an unenviable task. On a unique course, we're not point to point. Just under two and a quarter kilometres, 19 and a half times, with the backdrop of Buckingham Palace, the Mole, Birdcage Walk and Horse Guards Parade over and over again with a slight rise. What is it, six or seven metres apparently before coming round to the finish and if it's as entertaining as the women's race, well, boy, oh boy, these laps and mile markers will go past very quickly. And I think you mentioned during the women's coverage, Mara, and it's worth reiterating now, apparently this was the preferred course for the 159 attempt uh, that... last year. So it's, uh, it's, it's fast and we know it's just about as flat as you can possibly get. That's right. This was one of the courses considered for Kipchoge's sub two attempt. They ended up doing it in Vienna, uh, but it was right up there. And you can see why there's there's almost no undulation that that little graph we just saw of the um, elevation was a little bit misleading. If you look at the axis on the left hand side, the, the maximum elevation was six meters. So it's a completely flat course. No sharp corners, really. The only one which is a little bit sharp uh, is from um, Horse Guards Road onto Birdcage Walk. I think that's the, the corner we've just seen. Um, otherwise, not particularly sharp corners. And, of course, with a lap course, if you stick on the blue line, which you can see there to the right of the group of runners, uh, next to the red banners, if you stick on the blue line, which is the shortest course, uh, you will end up running the shortest distance. It was interesting in the women's race that we often saw them off the blue line. So let's hope that the men's, their coaches have told them to stick to the blue line religiously. As for the women's race, there are races within races here today. Uh, Rob, at the sharp end, it's all about Kipchoge and the other Africans but many athletes will be trying to get the men's Tokyo Olympic qualifying time of 2.11.30. Some already have it and will be looking to cement their place with their national federations selection processes. 4.43, so that's yeah, it's just outside 2.03 pace. So for the leaders, the likes of Elliot Kipchoge, Geremu and Wasihun, who I've seen in there alongside Lemmer and Tamirat Toller, who was third in Dubai a couple of years ago with just outside 204. This is all fairly good. Uh, it's a sensible pace that they've requested, Mara. The lead group have asked the pacemakers to take them through in 61. And and if we bear in mind, you know, Elliot's, Elliot's <coughs> time last year was absolutely phenomenal. You know, 202, it wasn't quite the world record for Berlin, but I think everybody would acknowledge that, that London, it, it is a world record course, Canucci broke the world record in 02, I think, when Turgat was second and yeah. Hailey was third on his debut in something like 206 plus change. The, the traditional London course is fast, yep. but probably not quite as fast as Berlin, which is why we've seen more world records in Berlin. Perhaps. Yeah, and of course, Paula, record, Paula Radcliffe sorry, broke, the, uh, broke two world records. Sorry, 215.25, the, the one with male pacemakers she set in London. I think the other one she had was in Chicago. Um, but yes, it's a fast course. Um, very flat, no sharp corners. You know, th this could be the only opportunity that these athletes get to run on such a fast course. So we didn't quite see the world record that we were expecting in the women's race. Um, but the, the, the lead pace group has been asked to go out for a finish time of 201.30 to 202. 
uh, through halfway in 61. So, so that is a world record attempt if, if everything goes to plan. Those three pacemakers at the front there in, in red vests and black shorts, that's Noah Kip Kemboy, Jonathan Career, and Eric Kip Tanui, all from Kenya. Of course, the pacemakers are world-class athletes in their own right. You know, they running 61 for a half marathon is, is no mean feat. And they are, they are employed by the race organizers on behalf of the athletes to help them to, to a good time. We talked about Berlin. Berlin is, is really regarded as the fastest course in the world. Uh, most world record attempts I think have been done on Berlin, but, but London has been a very fast course. But today we're on a different course because of the pandemic, uh, and therefore course records, uh, London course records will not be set today. Uh, if the London course record is broken, it won't be counted as an official London course record because we're on a different course. But this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for these athletes to run on a very, very fast course. And Mara, what, what would you make of the view that, you know, on the one hand, yes, we have been denied, denied a great head-to-head -head between Eliud Kipchoge and Kenanisa Bekele. But in terms of focusing on times, it might make things a little simpler because, of course, Eliud Kipchoge has huge respect for everybody against whom he lines up in a major marathon. He's a great student of his sport. I think with Bekele in the race, there might have been an extra couple of percent of Kipchoge's mindset thinking, I actually have to win this race, let alone break the records. Whereas no disrespect to Geremu and Wasihun, who could put him under pressure along with one or two others, but maybe it focuses the mind on the times rather without that huge potential head-to-head -head duel. Um, you know, they, they would have been alongside each other at, at, at this point. They're not. So Kipchoge can fully focus on perhaps setting a very, very quick time here. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, Kipchoge, you know, to do sub two, that was effectively a time trial on his own. He, he had pacemakers around him, but it wasn't really a race. It was a time trial. And you know, he's shown that he can run very fast times by himself. He doesn't need to be pushed by rivals to, to run fast times. So I don't think Bekele's withdrawal particularly will, will bother Kipchoge. He's, you know, he's shown us that he can run very fast times. Uh, just, he, you know, he goes and does it. He doesn't really need that rivalry. That was Brett Robinson just going through shot there, the Australian, 30th in the World Cross, that brutal course in Aarhus. And Samo Farah, pacemaking duties over a big group, including Ross Millington and Arne Gabius. Gabius, the German who's been around a while. Um, 4.49 for that mile, so another, another solid effort. Um, Mara, whilst we have got plenty of time to talk about it, and you, you have got great expertise as a 10,000-metre runner, Commonwealth medalist, and on the marathons, the right decision by Sir Mo to decide that the marathon is not his prime event and his prime distance because boy oh boy is he going to have his work cut out against Joshua Cheptegei next year at the <laughs> Olympic Games if we have one were you surprised do you see that as the right decision for Mo I, I'm tempted to say that I think the competition in the men's marathon is tougher than the track but you know seeing seeing people like chapter guy <laughs> you know you I, I don't know if you can even make that claim so uh, you know if you if you think of mo having to defeat athletes like kipchoge geremu wasihun bekele to to win olympic gold you just think mm, that's that's just not going to happen and he he's perhaps more of a track runner but then you know things change as you get older sometimes you, you know he's won everything there is to win on the track so maybe a new challenge would have, the, the marathon had the appeal of being a new challenge but he he said he's going back to the track for tokyo uh, that is his decision as far as we know now and you know we we've seen from his performances on the track that he he can he can win in lots of different scenarios he wins by you know sitting in and and producing that incredible sprint finish at the end so yeah i think I think he possibly missed the track, having switched to the marathon. But Mo Farah today, pacing 
the the last of these four groups, uh, and they've been given instructions to go through halfway in 65.30 to 65.45, aiming for that Olympic qualifying time of 2.11.30. Yes, and we will pay close attention to that benchmark. There are three. The director clearly at some point will focus in on the uh, British battle for domestic glory. There are three men who've got that time. Callum Hawkins, who I think is such an exciting prospect, fourth in London and fourth in Doha Boya. But when he came back to the leaders last year, I thought he was going to win the race. It's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> so he's, yeah. he's pre-selected. Uh, Samo has the qualifying time, but as Mara's just been talking about, he's focusing on the 10,000 next year, should we have an Olympic Games, touch wood. Uh, so Johnny Mellor's the other one with the qualification time after that uh, fabulous... 2.10.03 or 2.10.04, it varies depending on which website you look at, when he was 22nd uh, in Seville. But the likes of Chris Thompson uh, will be trying to take him on. And we've got all sorts of other great athletes. Watch out as well for Daniel Meucci. The Italians have got a fine history when it comes to marathon running. Gelindo Bourdain and then, of course, Stefano Baldini. Baldini's had a couple of decent finishes here in London. He was second 23 years ago. Such a great major championship performer. What a win that was from his in Athens 2004. So Meucci, yes, won't necessarily be expected to win this race, but watch out for him. He's quite a consistent performer, so there'll be some European pride on the line here. Meanwhile, in this lead group, we have the might of the East Africans trying to take on and tame Eliud Kipchoge, who has not been beaten over the marathon distance since his second outing with a not too shabby 2.04.05. He has never in his life run a bad marathon. Interesting a moment ago, Rob, that we saw some of this lead group take their drinks from the drink station at around 11 minutes, which is very early on in a marathon. I was a bit surprised by that because it's a cool day. Uh, predicted uh, forecast when we looked earlier was 10 degrees. It does look like it stopped raining though. A little bit difficult to see, but um, so quite chilly. And ordinarily, in a, a race like this, the elite athletes would get their special drinks at every every 5k, so 5k, 10k, 15, and so on. So quite early for them to be taking drinks. Uh, it's a 2.15k loop around St James's Park, and they have a drink station. There's one drink station per lap. So if they want to, they can drink very frequently, but I think we'll see a lot of athletes skipping their drinks on some of the laps, perhaps, perhaps grabbing a drink, a drink every other lap. Of course, they're running clockwise, uh, and on, on an athletics track, they run anti-clockwise, so a little bit different from, from track racing. We did see a race in Prague in September, which was, I think it was 16 and a half laps, um, of a of a just over one kilometer loop so this isn't the first time this format has been used and of course the london olympics last year's doha world championships the london world championships in 2017 also used a loop course 1448 mara it's just about low 203s so it's pretty much what the elites have asked for in the very very early stages Moeen still up with that group. We haven't really spoken too much about the Norwegian, who was the European record holder for quite some time with that 205.48 in Fukuoka. Now fourth <coughs> on the European list and a fine cross-country runner. Ran well in the Europeans, uh, sorry, in the World Championships last year with 11th over the 10,000 metres. But today is all about that man, front and centre in your picture. The world 5,000 metre champion from 2003, a bronze medalist on the track, a silver medalist on the track, and then arguably, well, I was going to say his crowning moment becoming Olympic champion, but he might argue the crowning moment was breaking the world record, winning <laughs> London for the fourth time, <coughs> or running 159. It's it, an embarrassment of riches, It's ridiculous, Rob. isn't it? Absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. But yeah. do you know what? I, I, I'm going to stick to my guns on that, Mara. I... I I'm pretty sure I'm correct in the following statistic in that no, until Kipchoge, I'm fairly sure I'm right in saying no reigning world record holder, male or female, had won the Olympic title. 
because it's a completely different type of race. And I was so impressed. The 208 and a half that, that he won it in was, was an irrelevance. I mean, for him, it's almost, it's not a jog, but it's so, com so far within his comfort range. It, you know, it, I, I just loved the way he bossed that race. And, and to break that jinx was really incredible. And there was just a beautiful symmetry about the moment in Rio as well. I'll never forget it because he had the bronze, he had the silver from, from Athens and Beijing, missed out on the place missed out on a place in the team over the 10,000 in 2012 and then turned his attention to the roads and all of a sudden you know all those years later he did complete the set of Olympic medals so call me old-fashioned the 159 is amazing world records are great but no one's ever going to take that gold medal away from his mantelpiece so for me that's his that's his crowning moment would you agree or, or, yeah. or, or would you pick would you pick the sub two maybe it's an embarrassment of riches to choose from I mean that saying an olympic champion and world record holder that that's an example of how he's so consistent you know you you get phenomenal athletes like paula radcliffe for example long long held the world record but never won the olympics um your 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 question i'm afraid is challenging my <laughs> knowledge statistical knowledge of the history of the marathon but i'm thinking naoko takahashi won the 2000 sydney olympics and also was the first woman ever to break 220. um i'm from memory, she broke 220 after winning uh, Sydney. Um, well, uh, ans answers on a postcard with that one. I, I <laughs> it, 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 I'm sure while we're on air, the, the, the statisticians somebody and will correct out us there will, will tweet us if we've yeah, got it yeah. wrong. But yeah. no, I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah, I, I just love the fact that he's got He's got the capability to race intelligently as well as to follow pacemakers and, and run fast times. And speaking of pacemakers, four-time Olympic champion. Doesn't come much better than that in terms of Samo Farah. And accompanying him there wearing pace eight is Matt Close, who ran 2.13.57 last year in Berlin. So pretty useful marath marathon runner in his own right. Course. we said earlier that the pacemakers are here to do a job typically they'll go to halfway sometimes to 25k uh, they'll be, they'll have been given instructions from the organizers have it, who will have spoken to all the athletes and their agents and there's several groups so the top group we saw earlier going th aiming for 20130 to 202 the second group aiming for 204 the third group 208 to 20830 uh, and the final group this group aiming for 2.11 to 2.11.30 for that Olympic qualification Yeah, time. and they've, just to clarify the times there, Mara, that group that we're watching went through in around about 15.40, which is, yeah, sort of high 2.12s. I mean, it's such a long way to go, but it's, it's a nice, steady start for these guys from which they can build heading into the second half of the race but there is such a long way to go yeah i mean in, in these early stages you don't want to worry too much about the pace i mean obviously you don't want to be much outside your target uh, but the most efficient way to to run a marathon is even splits as soon as you as you diverge from that and and at any time you're going faster than what you would be doing under even splits you use up energy and fuel and so on and therefore more likely to hit the wall before the end so as evenly as possible uh, is, is is what the pacemakers instructions are but of course the pacemakers are only human and sometimes mistakes happen um, but obviously mo and matt very experienced the third athlete there in the elite there in the in the red vest is shadrach kiminning kiminning uh who ran 59 27 for a half marathon in january this year and so also a world-class athlete we talked earlier about moen from norway rob he's a very interesting athlete if you look down the men's marathon world all-time list you go through pages and pages and pages of of kenyans and ethiopians with a few other east africans thrown in uh, but the first non-african you get to is osako of japan and second non-african is is Moen from Norway. He made an incredible um, improvement in 2017, uh, running 2:10:07 
in Hanover and then in Fukuoka in December in 2017, going to 205.48. And that 205.48 in, in, in non-East African running terms really is world class. Yeah, I remember it being a huge PB at the time. He's the national record holder in Norway over the 10, the half marathon and the marathon. European cross country under 23 bronze almost 10 years ago. And actually, Moeen ran quite well. We're looking at Eliud Kipchoge, talking about Moeen, the Norwegian, who's there or thereabouts towards the back, bounce towards the back of that group. Uh, Moeen ran quite well. A seventh in Valencia last December, low 206s. I think that was the closest he'd come to get back to the Fukuoka form at the end of last year. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that battle for European honours. But this looks metronomic from Eliud Kipchoge. Kipchumba. That was Vincent Kipchumba just uh, behind him. Low 205s, won Amsterdam. Huge improvements from him last year. But we're once again focusing on the group looking for Olympic qualification time, which is 2.11.30. Mo Farah glancing over his shoulder. Barrios, the Mexican. Barrios is a, was a fantastic 5,000 metre runner. Five times a Pan American medalist over the 5,000 and 10,000. And PB for Barrios of 2.10.55. So he has done the qualification standard, but that was in 2018, which was before the qualification period started. So I think he needs to he needs to run that 2.11.30 during, during the qualification period. Grice, Nash, Lund, Scott and Martelletti, British contenders. Martelletti's run 2.16 in Berlin. Josh Lundrob ran 66 minutes at the Antrim half marathon in September. So some good recent form. So these athletes training during a pandemic is, is a real, they face the real challenge of just not having many competition opportunities at all. And we've seen some track races going on in Europe, um, but very limited uh, possibilities on the road. I know, and it's funny, isn't it, Mara? You, you, you've got to. Re those guys have been blown out the back of the pace set by the the lead group, and yet you've got to remind yourself that the you know the likes of Lun, Nash, Martelletti, they would absolutely wipe the floor at any park run anywhere in the world. They are absolutely <laughs> brilliant runners, yep. but they're on a different level to these guys. Right, five miles, twenty-three. 52. Uh, just having a, a quick check to while confirm checking, who's in that group. While you're checking that, Rob, it's worth remembering that every man running today is world class. Uh, you, you don't qualify for a race like the London Marathon. You have to be invited uh, to, to participate. So you have to have the CV of performances to, to get an invitation um, for, from the race. So. They may look like also runs compared to people like Kipchoge, but every man starting this race today is world class. It's worth reminding viewers, Rob, that 45,000 recreational runners are out there as we speak, pounding the streets all over the globe. Um, and that includes 10 men who are members of the Ever Presence Club. They are men who have completed every single London marathon since it started 40 years ago. The youngest is Chris Finnell, who's age 61 now, um, and they stretch up into the 80s. I think the oldest is Kenneth Jones at age 87. So it started off as a much bigger group and has dwindled, but 10 of them uh, have committed to being out there completing the virtual London marathon your way. Um, as the, the, the marathon have branded it, between midnight and 11.59.59 p.m. tonight. So very, very good luck to those ever presents. And may, may we see 10 of them out next year again? I hope so. Yep, you took the words out of my mouth. October the 3rd next year. Here's hoping that that will be absolutely rammed with family and friends waiting to greet loved ones at the end of the race. If you've, if you've ever run it as a club runner or fun runner, it is so hard to find anyone at the end. 
especially if you go back to the 90s pre-mobile phone they used to have well you would never have experienced this Mara because you're so good they used to have a, 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 the avenue of trees I mean, 26 trees and they would say go to the letter that your surname starts with because if you remember nothing at the end of the marathon no matter how badly or well the race has gone you'll always remember what your name is <laughs> yeah but you'd go yeah. you'd go to the tree say with mine it would be the w for walker but there would be hundreds and <laughs> hundreds of people gathered around and it would take yeah. ages to find everyone oh there was yeah. there was a beauty and a simplicity to life before mobile phones uh, by the way just to clarify um on that five mile checkpoint i've got my two uh, pace charts here k's and uh, and miles we like we like the miles in old fashioned old fashioned money in the in the in the british system at uh, 2352 just outside 204 so it's a it's a solid rather than a spectacular pace in the very early stages we'll get the kilometer splits for you as well as and when they emerge but um yep. it's a sensible pace and maybe the likes of Elliot Kipchoge, well, we know he's more than capable. 201.39, the official world record. Maybe he'll be looking to pick up the pace as we edge towards the halfway stage. But it's, uh, they're not ripping up the trees as far as the early pace is concerned, but I, I think this is pretty sensible. Oh, there's Moeen, by the way, just on, yep. the, just on the back <laughs> of that group on the left. He's the Norwegian we were talking about. But Kipchoge, Mara, should look comfortable at this pace and does look comfortable. Absolutely. I mean, like with Koska in the women's race, this is some four minutes, three to four minutes slower than his, his best. Uh, I just wonder if, the, I, I mean, the men have the benefit of having seen the women not produce a world record, and I just wonder if they, they may possibly have adjusted their ambitions slightly. It is still raining. I thought it had stopped, but it's, it started again. Meucci there from Italy, we talked about earlier, brilliant championship performer. Hasn't broken 2.10, but he really saves himself for the, for the big occasions. He was the European uh, champion back in 2014. We have to talk about shoes, Rob. Some viewers may have seen Elliot Kipchoge's shoes that he's wearing now uh, in the news earlier in the week. He's wearing a version of the Nike Alpha Fly, uh, and it has 159.40 written on the back of it for the benefit of his rivals. <laughs> Uh, so this is the latest version of these shoes with a with a high stack height, maximum limit of 40 millimeters, and a carbon plate, a curved carbon plate inside, which which gives you some energy return. The others appear to be in the vapor flies, the orange or pink shoes, but Kipchoge is in a version of the Alpha flies, which I, I think I'm right in saying he wore for the. He definitely wore for the 159.40 attempt. Yes, I, I think there may have been minute variations, but it's tantamount to the same to the same shoe. And I guess you know we, for those of you who were watching the elite women's race, we, we did touch on the the shoes because it is such a massive talking point in the distance running fraternity, and and it's a balancing act between gentle increments as technology advances and and big steps forward that are out of kilter with that by the way so what are we 29 45 yeah so it's that they could do with speeding up just a fraction it's it's steady by the standards that we're normally used to seeing from Elliot Kipchoge 30 minutes on the nose for 10k is uh, is around about low 206s so we can expect to see them speed up uh, a little bit and maybe Kipchoge is just having a word with them there that was the third pacemaker Eric Kiptanui Kiptanui a couple of excellent runs in Paris I think I commentated on him there I think he's had a, a 206 or a 207 and and maybe Eliud Kipchoge has just said to the pacemakers listen guys we need we need to up the ante yes you can see his arms going up there he wants this to be quicker his his arm gesture at the beginning of this conversation, Rob, looked like he was telling them to slow down. But that's down. But that's they look like them to speed up. And judging by the splits, I think he, I suspect he wants to go a little bit faster. Well, he certainly earned the right to have a word to have a word with the pacemakers, who you would duly respond. Distance running royalty says faster. <laughs> you say by how much, sir? I'll start immediately. Um, 
look, we we can't talk about the shoes all day, but but it, but it is it is worth it is worth touching on. One point you've made earlier today, Mara, that I really like is that World Athletics have begun an initiative where any elite athlete must have access to all the shoes that are legally available. Because you know, one of the reasons I fell in love with athletics and with distance running in particular is that you know it is probably the most accessible sport anywhere in the world. If you're able-bodied, you can run. And, you know, the, the, the spikes for the track nuances, that, that comes later. This is, you know, athletics is an incredibly inclusive sport. It, it has no regard for gender. There's every bit the same level of excitement for a women's 100 final as there would be for a men's. Athletics has been at the forefront in that regard for decades. And you've got, you know, within, within, within the sport, you've got so many different physiques. You know, these giant <laughs> shot putters. Tiny 10,000 metre runners like Haile Gabriel Selassie weighing seven or eight stone. You know, athletics prides itself on being the most accessible sport in the world, which is why you have so many people from different nationalities. And what I think is very important, whatever your view is with regards to the technology and the speed with which it's encouraging, shall we say, these records to get broken, it's so important that at the highest level it is equal for everybody because you know, it's it's a, it's absolutely a cliche. You know, there are many Africans who come from you know uh, loving, supportive, provided backgrounds. Not all of them start out with no shoes, but that is that is the basic principle of our sport. That anybody at any level, no matter how little money they have in their pocket, they should be able to access our sport. So at least from a world athletics point of view, they are ensuring that that equality remains in place. Yeah, the, the universality and accessibility of athletics is really critical of all the sports. You know, it requires very little technology. Until now, it has required very little technology. If you think of sports like rowing, fencing, triathlon, cycling, the performance is, is in some way determined by your equipment in addition to your the human endeavor. Running until now has been really entirely about human endeavor. OK, we have had shoes. Uh, but, you know, that's it. And the, the concerns around accessibility are, one, are the costs, so is it going to make people of modest financial means unable to do running? Um, and, we, and we must not ever let that happen, ever. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, then at elite level, World Athletics have now started this athletic shoe availability scheme to ensure that all athletes can access all shoes but don't forget that at elite level most athletes will have a contract with a shoe manufacturer so it's fine for the athletes who are with Nike with the Vaporflies, Alphaflies the other manufacturers now are bringing out shoes have brought out shoes uh, which have a blade which have a high stack height but whether those shoes can match the Nike shoes is sort of remains to be seen. And athletes who are not with Nike, then the question is, do they honor their contracts or do they breach their contracts and go with the Nike shoes? So, so there are lots of questions about accessibility. What this really boils down to is preserving meaning in results for me. So when an athlete crosses the line, can you categorically say, that performance was down to that athlete? Or are you saying, hmm, wait a minute, what shoes did that person have on? So it's, I mean, World Athletics have, they've put a moratorium effectively, frozen the status quo effectively until after the Tokyo Olympics. 